Samo, it's about time we, we had this conversation. Thank you for making time for it. I've heard your name many, many times in conversations around Game B. You're an expert and an influential thinker around existential risk, civilizational decline, and civilizational design. How would you summarize your interests and why, why is this topic the one that takes your, yeah, that you spend most of your time on? I would summarize it as this quest to sort of understand why all societies seem to in fact have an internal expiration date of some kind or another. Um, you know, it seems to be the case that no matter what the level of technology, be it a relatively simple society, a static society, uh, possibly with a Bronze Age economy, or, you know, a much more advanced civilization, you know, technically sophisticated, uh, they eventually all seem to come undone. Uh, we could easily imagine a world where this was quite different, right? Where societies were immortal rather than, in a sense, mortal. And this would have very important consequences for the future of mankind, right? It would mean that um, intellectual efforts, technological efforts, material efforts would reliably just add up and amount to uh, something very similar to this idea of progress that once existed. I'm skeptical of progress. I think. I think it's wishful thinking to say that we are that we've entered the ratchet of infinite improvement that eventually reaches to some sort of utopian state. Um, I also think we tend to systematically underestimate uh, past societies, parallel societies, foreign societies, and this limits our own imagination of what the future could be. So the study of other societies, how societies rise and fall, that very much, I think, expands our imagination of what the present and the near future can be. I'd love to kind of go into some of your, maybe use your conceptual framework and then delve in a little bit more deeply. But before we do that, I, I wonder where you th think we're at now, because I'm earlier in the in sort of it's about a year now since the COVID shutdowns really started to hit, maybe a little bit over a year. And there was a sense and we put out quite a few films on Rebel Wisdom talking about is this the sort of civilizational ratchet that is a sort of ongoing, is this when the rubber meets the road in terms of these civilizational issues? And I think it's fair to say that some of that speculation seems now a little bit overblown. Um, so where do you feel that we're at now in 2021? It seems to me that the pandemic wasn't the apocalypse. It, however, was another chapter in a relatively slow, boring, sort of gradual decline. I do currently think our, our civilization has deep underlying crises that it fails to resolve. Is there a single contradiction that has not been relevant to the, to the global pandemic? Is there a single contradiction that's not? Consider student debt, university system, and the role it plays in credentialing the role of media in accurately informing the public, trust in bureaucracies, trust in experts, um, you know, UBI, every single topic of the last 10 or 20 years that was discussed as this, you know, looming problem, however, never amounted to something of great consequence, found itself under discussion, found itself impacted, found itself being part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So I think what the pandemic reveals is that we are an underlying, uh, we are underlyingly a very fragile society that has significant material reserves that we exhaust to buy ourselves more time. But this time that we buy ourselves with these material reserves, we, we essentially waste. Um, you know, whether you're pro-vaccine, against vaccines, skeptical of vaccines, the fact is, you know, this vaccine was developed just a few weeks after the pandemic struck. We could have had human challenge trials to get it approved so much more, you know, so, so much faster. We could have had massive investment in, in building, you know, vaccination capacity and all of this stuff. Uh, it never happened, but we did have stimulus checks of several you know, trillion dollars worth of stimulus checks that essentially showed them showed up in stock prices and showed up in the existing class of extractive institutions. You know, the common citizen received a thousand dollar check, if that at all, right? So in a way, you know, it was a bigger bailout than 2008. 
It was a financial crisis, a political crisis, a moral crisis, a scientific crisis, all rolled into one. And we sort of, we, we were drowsy, we were confused. We, we you know, tussled in our sleep, um, but I don't think we awoke. And do you think there's a natural order to go into either your great founder theory or your life players theory? Does one follow more naturally on from the other? Well, I think the most natural proposal here is that I, I don't really think we would need a, a great founder. Like a great founder is someone I define as uh, an individual capable of changing the social machinery of their society, introducing radically new social technologies, code of, codes of law, religion, ways of being, uh, completely novel spiritual practices, uh, completely novel economic systems, political systems, and so on. Uh, you know, say Lycurgus of Sparta could be considered a great founder for their society, you know, uh, for Western civilization as a whole. You might choose to pick, you know, a philosopher like Aristotle or for East Asian, for Chinese civilization, you might pick Confucius, or you might say focus on, uh, you know, a, a military a figure that Haver was also a social reformer, such as Charlemagne, for example, um, or you know other other examples, possibly even Alexander the Great. You can make an argument uh, that he was directly responsible for modern intellectual accomplishment through things such as founding the city of Alexandria, bringing you know uh, Greek philosophy into contact with Egyptian Babylonian technology and you know uh, Indian philosophy. It seems to me that nothing like that was needed. All that was needed was live players, live players being, you know, individuals, organizations, or small groups that can operate off script. That is, do not simply follow a checklist. None of the problems of the last two years, the last year and a half of the pandemic, would have been solved by us simply following a predictable checklist. It was an unpredictable event. And the procedures bureaucracies had in place to handle such unpredictable events were woefully, you know, they could not be adequate. It's not a matter of preparation. It's not that we were unprepared for a global pandemic because you could never predict all the details of a global pandemic. What was the case is that we were over, -pre over prepared, over specialized into a very narrow idea of the future. Note that the CDC in the United States did very poorly when it came to COVID-19, but did very well when it came to handling Zika. Why? Because the CDC was specialized in putting out essentially these kind of biological fires like Zika or Ebola happening in small powerless countries in the third world, in the tropics. Uh, no one was ready for a disease coming out of China, a country that can lobby and move the WHO if it so chooses to adopt policies that are perhaps excellent for China, less good for the rest of the world. So this narrow specialization on the scenario where it's a small disease in a relatively impoverished country that's you know completely open to say Western influence and intervention, requires no inconveniences at home, requires no drastic measures such as limits on travel or you know limits on public gatherings. Um, you know you couldn't have really, in advance set something up that had the power to do all of this uh, and not first, not abuse this power. And secondly, lie dormant for a hundred years. It's completely unrealistic to imagine that there could have been say an agency of pandemics established in 1920 that would have stayed functional for a hundred years. What however very much is imaginable is that institutions in the United States were headed by people that understood that there was upside, not merely downside, from behaving in novel, unpredictable ways when novel and unpredictable actions are the only thing that could possibly you know, save you from the situation. There are situations where you want to reduce variance of outcomes, and there are situations where you want to increase variance of outcomes. When the default future is disastrous, you are seeking variance. So if no one in any position of power has, has ever been selected for a desire to seek variance in outcomes rather than reducing variance in outcomes, uh, it's very unlikely that there'll be many life players out there. It's very unlikely that there'll be individuals who are willing to act from first principle analysis, uh, even if the rest of society doesn't even understand what they're doing yet. 
Um, and it also seems to me that there has been this abdication of responsibility to such a complete and deep degree uh, that really, you know, really you, you don't want to inherit any of the existing institutions. If you're a live player today, you are forced into creative disruption. It's not a choice. It's not admirable that in America we have so much creative destruction uh, when it comes to economic growth. I actually think it shows that we are really, really bad at uh, allowing novel ideas and, you know, sort of intelligent novel thinking, like thinking that's not tied to social acceptability into positions of responsibility. It shows that we have to constantly bypass these old piles of resources. So they could not have been an agency of pandemics. Neither the FDA or the CDC could have possibly been prepared in lying in wait for this exact scenario. What could have been is that there was a political, social, or scientific position in the United States where someone would just go out there and say, you know, I actually believe a, p a pandemic is happening. I'm suspending all of my agency's activities. Uh, instead of this, we are starting to stockpile masks that we have on our own initiative bought from the world market. Uh, we also encourage citizens to donate masks. They're not enough masks. We're also beginning construction of vaccine plants, which hopefully will be online in six months. Like that's just, you know, that type of decision, that type of announcement is just unimaginable. So I feel our society, you know, actively selects against live players that want to do anything but create software startups. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting um, way of framing it. So I think I think most people will be aware of what live players means. I've I found myself using that concept. It's one of those mental models that once I kind of understood it, I started using it everywhere. It seems to be very, very, has a huge explanatory power for a lot of different areas. Um, I guess we should just start by framing what a live player is. And it, it, it is really as simple as a player that is capable of novelty rather than running off a script. And if that's the case, do you think that the pandemic, what the pandemic has done is exposed the, the deadness of a lot of the players in, in the current landscape? Is that its primary function? Well, I think it, uh, it would be almost optimistic to say it revealed uh, that, you know, we have mostly dead players rather than live players. I think the reality is we've not learned anything. I can't point to a single large cultural shift that has happened except a premature enthusiasm for remote work that sort of is slowly evaporating away, right? Six months ago, remote work was the future. Right now, people are excited to go back to work. You know, Apple has sort of, you know, said that, you know, people will in fact have to go back to the offices. So even in software, which was most predisposed to say, move into a completely virtual workplace, that didn't happen. But really, that's such a tiny under adjustment. Does anyone even remember that, all of the major institutions of society were confidently and loudly wrong back in March 2020 or April 2020. Like, I don't think this is remembered. I don't think people have updated their assumption. So in a way, for a brief moment, we saw that most of the resources in society are locked up in dead players. And then we decided to forget because really, what are you going to do about it? And it's interesting that you talked to, you kind of linked live player to sort of first principles thinkers as that being a definition of, uh, or a prerequisite for being a live player. Because one of the, the, the times that I find it most useful is looking at the, what was known as the intellectual dark web. And it was a sort of uh, coalescing of different personalities, different sort of podcast hosts and public intellectuals. And I found it very useful very early on to say, and that, and one of the characteristics that they sort of self-proclaimed was that they were all first principles thinkers. But I felt very early on that not many of them were actually live players. There was a sense that once you understood where they were coming from, there wasn't really a sense they were updating their models or they were generating genuine novelty. Um, so that's a real paradox of even people who pride themselves on the characteristics that define a live player are often not necessarily being that, embodying that, why does that happen and how do how do if, if it's that 
if if it's that easy to slip out of being a live player, how do we avoid it? I think that's a, that's a very good observation. Um, first principles thinking is helpful, right? It is a prerequisite. Um, it is necessary, but not sufficient. I think it's actually rather difficult to maintain this type of aliveness in this sense, the strategic aliveness. And the reason is that over time, you know, over time, over through the course, over the course of a normal life, we go from almost infinite exploration to a very narrow type of exploitation to introduce the exploration versus exploitation trade-off that, you know, you might see discussed in uh, machine learning literature or analysis of, of strategic, uh, you know, in, in game theory analysis or the analysis of, of various games. Um, basically, we like to do what already works. So very often what happens is we discover something that works. We stick, for, we stick to it. We specialize in it. And before long, we've lost this sort of cognitive breadth to be interested in the world. But secondly, we've lost the motivational spark to try new patterns of behavior, All right? So I really feel that when it comes to the role of a purely public intellectual without uh, attachment to something like managing a movement or participating in an organization or adopting new social roles, um, you are, you know, you, you're actually put in something of a straitjacket. Everyone knows what a public intellectual is supposed to be, right? They're supposed to go on a particular set of interviews. There's a style of writing they're supposed to undertake. Their book is supposed to look a certain way. And it is a limiting position. And not only that, there's a terrible paradox I noticed when, uh, you know, like observing the careers of public intellectuals over time, their most popular work is often their worst work, right? Right. Um, you know, you, you look at someone like Francis Fukuyama, mostly famous right now for being wrong for, uh, you know, something called the end of history, right? The hypothesis that, you know, political development would stop in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you read some of his obscure essays. His obscure essays are actually great. They're very much worth reading. He like, you know, contemplates the consequences of transhuman technology and how it changes human nature, how it might mean a break from previous politics, from previous societal evolution, but that doesn't really get attention. So there are two things that happen. Uh, success, you know, whether as intellectual or a CEO or whatever, brings immense social pressure and a big stick, right? The stick being a scandal, uh, political pressure and so on, but also, you know, this carrot behave in exactly this template and you will be rewarded. So on the one hand, it's a little bit of a straight jacket. On the other hand, there's also the, the, the reality that your most conventional stuff is the most visible. Mm -hmm. Now the counter examples to this might be people such as Elon Musk, right? Where Elon Musk goes out of his way to break the template of what a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company is supposed to look like. I guarantee you, without the exact branding moves that he has, uh, his calls for removal would have been followed up by actual removal. And, you know, it's kind of sad that he stands out as much as he does, right? It is a little bit, of course, a dedication to self-promotion that causes him to stand out. But he also stands out because so few other CEOs uh, are like him right? They're mostly custodians. Yeah, one of the analogies that I come back to is like great artists um, will make an effort to throw off their previous or great pop stars, for example, like David Bowie would make an effort to throw off their previous fans. Like every, mm -hmm. every time there would be a reinvention with the aim of you don't want to get you don't want to, to kind of coalesce around your previous work and you'd keep doing that. But it seems very, very difficult to do that. Um, it seems increasingly difficult to do that now. I think maybe when there's so much more social pressure and more social observation, but, but there seems to have to be a, a dedication to that reinvention. And also something that came up is the idea that there's a very different felt sense from inside. Like if you're David Bowie or if you're, if you're sort of one of these 
artists, you can either follow the money and just give the people what they want, but there's a certain deadening of the spirit that seems to come in with that, or you can challenge and sort of stay true to your your daemon, as 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 some people might might call it. I think that the following of your passion as an artist necessarily means that you have deeply explored an emotion and then you're done. It's somewhat strange to build to build a career out of 50 or 60 smash, you know, smash hit singles discussing heartbreak. Shouldn't you be wiser in your relationships by then? And if you're not wiser in your relationship and you're constantly reminiscing on past relationships or even worse, you know, you are faking these feelings. You're not feeling them. You're merely mining work of other artists that have had genuine, profound experiences, remixing them and repackaging them. Yeah, that's that's deadening. Um, I think, you know, I, I feel that, you know, Gen X is uh, a generation that's been kind of erased. But one thing that I feel Gen X has an advantage compared to people of my generation, millennials, um, is that they had the concept of selling out. Selling out was understood to be something, right? It meant not so much that you achieved success, that's desirable, that's desirable in all cultures. It meant that you disconnected from your work, right? It meant you became alienated from your work. Your work was no longer at all connected to the subjective creative experience that you pursued. Um, and, you know, we're very natural that we ended up with artists, but I would claim that again, you know, so leaders of social movements, religious leaders, um, scientists, they should be much more like artists. And they, in fact, were for most of history, right? Today, when we analyze someone like Isaac Newton, we want to, you know, uh, sterilize and polish him. We like Isaac Newton, who is making up terms related to forces that move the planets and that, you know, govern the laws of, you know, our solar system of gravity. We dislike the Isaac Newton that spent a lot of his time digging into the Bible, trying to you know, decode numerological secrets or you know, running experiments with alchemy. But the reality is, you know, if you don't want Isaac Newton, the alchemist, you're not going to get Isaac Newton, the scientist. They're, in fact, the same person. Hmm. That's really, yeah. I, so did you, did you say that you think Gen X was the last generation to have a concept of selling out that made sense to them? Yep. Arguably, this is an ever escalating case of earlier and earlier socialization to be disconnected from first your labor, but now also your social performances. If you consider, you know, Zoomers as a generation, it's quite possible that you have spent your entire adolescent years performing for a camera for the creation of like these very, very short clips. And the algorithmic feedback of becoming extremely popular when you are 18 should be understood to be equivalent to the feedback, you know, of a heavy industrial hammer uh, crushing your arm. The outcomes for child actors are atrocious. I honestly think we might just want to ban child acting. But if you look at the statistics for people who are child actors in, you know, you know, let's say Hollywood specifically, the peak of the industry, and you then count suicide, and then you count suicides, uh, you count mental breakdowns, you realize that, wait, whatever these children experience, it caused them to fail as adults really profoundly. It depends on how exactly you count them, but you have these absurd statistics like 20 or 25% suicide rates. Who would be comfortable signing up their child to a career in a coal mine if you believed the fatality rate was 25%. Yet somehow we're comfortable with child actors. And somehow, again, we're comfortable with massive algorithmic, you know, hammers, ham hammering our brains, uh, getting us before we've even discovered who we are. So is, is that because you're almost caught in like a hall of mirrors at a very young age? You're probably not you've got no time to develop who you really are. You're basically reacting to what other people think of you and the crowd's reaction. And is your sense that we've actually moved into that place as a kind of generational thing? 
I think it's a little bit generational, but I think there's we shouldn't underestimate the reach of this across generations, right? So it's most apparent in the people who have been longest exposed to it relative to their total life experience. So if 80% of your life, you have been exposed to these incentives of socialization, these economic incentives, these creative incentives, um, then, you know, disassociation is the most rewarding thing, you know, socially, economically, even politically. If, however, you have some life experience of a different set of learning, you know, a different set of life experiences, then possibly you might be okay. However, you know, note that let's, let's look at say baby boomers, right? They're actually the most vulnerable generation when it comes to disinformation. Like they've done studies on this, you know, uh, fake news spreads on Facebook, mostly with people over 50. These are people who grow up in a little bit of a different media environment where you could sort of rely on relevant authorities, or at least you thought you could rely, right? There was this appearance, this pretense of objectivity, and that sort of completely breaks down. Um, they are reshaped by new experiences as much as young people are. So in a way, you know, I sometimes use these generational markers more to describe moments in our shared culture than as if, you know, these are different kinds of people. They're really not, right? They're, they're, they are human beings of different ages, but I think generations are at best a useful fiction. It's much better to think of it as like 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s, who has or does not have the experience of 2008. Uh, and, you know, it's the evolution of culture, right? We are all always permeated by culture. And is there, you mentioned the word spiritual earlier on, and is there a sort of spiritual dimension to this sort of tension between being a live player or not? Yeah. And I think that phenomenal, it, the phenomenology of it is difficult to describe, but when you feel it, you feel it. There are all of these words that people have tried to use to describe elements of it, right? Such as, you know, being in flow. N no one really talks about being in flow anymore. 2010, if you're talking about being in flow, you're talking about um, serious play, you're talking about this uh, creative experience of being lost in work, like finding yourself in work, finding yourself in the life process of it. If today you're talking about flow, well, you know, you're probably talking about a, a sort of um, a tidy office. You're talking about productivity. You're talking about maximizing productivity. So I'm trying to communicate here the like sort of interesting context where your priorities shift in the subtle way and different things seem to matter, right? And you can kind of tell when it's relevant that certain language rises and it's associated with such feelings. It's associated with such priorities, the priorities of being a sort of a live player, of being adaptive, of being agentic, creative in your environment. But that very same language, you know, you might say, you know, uh, being real or being in flow or being authentic, that same language will be debased. So words won't mean the same thing that they used to mean. Saying you should be authentic in 1980s California is completely different than saying being authentic in 2020s California. In 2020s California, it might actually be advice uh, given to you by an HR person. Be authentic the way we want you to be. And so what forces what what forces are working against being a live player? And what does that mean societally? And what does that mean for individuals? I think societally it means that um, society is in a dynamic equilibrium with its environment, right? If you have debt players, you know, you might have shepherding of large stockpiles of relatively, um, you know, useful but static resources that are inevitably depleted by new events as the old situations those uh, institutions were designed for dissolve away. So you might have, uh, you know, massive economic crises, you might have political crises, you might have, um, you know, really, really long term stagnation where the style of art doesn't change for five or 600 years. Um, you know, on the other hand, like live player societies might be unstable 
in completely different ways. It's certainly possible to have a society that has too many life players that are, in fact, always at war. You know, Renaissance Italy was not a peaceful place, right? In a literal sense, there was not just political rivalries and intrigues in each of the city states, there was constant warfare between the city states. So I feel the best society is a society that is in that golden mean of enough live players to revive and refresh all institutions on about a you know 10 year time scale like on a on a time 10 year period a sort of jubilee right an institutional jubilee uh, where you let go of the past and recreate many things from the fa- from the past but not quite everything um, but there's not so many live players that they start strongly competing for truly scarce resources, right? Resources that are in principle scarce. There are such things, right? There is such thing as, um, you know, a desire for for glory, a desire for recognition, a certain definitions of wealth, not other definitions of wealth uh, that certainly are, are zero sum, even in principle. For individuals, though, I think this, it is something of this fundamental shift where I think it is the case you will you will not be thinking the same way if you are a live player. It's it's a process, right? It's not a state. It is a process that is running in you that you are running. If you look at a live player in year one, year five, year eight, year ten, they will be a different person every single time. So it's not that they'll be like a very stable personality necessarily. They'll be a very functional personality through this entire time. Uh, but they will have reinvented themselves many times over. And this, in fact, does produce its own difficulties. It produces difficulties with maintaining uh, particular sets of social relationships. Now, of course, appropriate skill, appropriate resources make it very easy to honor your past social commitments rather than find them entrapping. So there's a, a type of abundance there. However, it's also true that the majority of our social relationships are not entered out of, you know, this kind of a Hobbesian social contract, sorry, not Hobbesian, like, you know, Lockean social contract. Um, In fact, they, they often arise as the boring default, right? So I do think live players will often end up with my somewhat unconventional lives. Right. They might, of course, still be socially conservative in views or thinking or something like this, but say their career is going to have unusual jumps. Uh, they might go from being a musician to being a book author uh, or to managing a publishing company, right? Or even more profound shifts, such as academic to politician, right? Or just, you know, uh, dropping out of what seemed an extremely promising career track, you know, to go live in the woods. And then you return out. You, you return authoring uh, either a book or starting, you know, a new religious or spiritual movement. These are definitely, you know, the kind of lives that say would be confusing to your friends and family at best, even if you do your best to to take them along for the ride. Hmm. And I guess there's two questions that come up. One of which is, are there certain times, either in kind of in, in culture and societal history or in one's personal life when becoming a live player becomes more important? I think it's almost a, are you searching for variance, right? What is your default future? If your default future is good, well, I can understand the temptation of being remaining a dead player. I would argue it's still not the correct choice but that's simply, you know, my kind of philosophical bias, right? My philosophical bias would be uh, you seek maximum aliveness. Don't seek comfort. However, you can't really blame anyone uh, for seeking comfort, for seeking happiness, essentially. So if your default future appears good or good enough, very well, you know, that might be that might be fine. It might be a fine way to live life. It certainly has stability. It avoids suffering. It uh, enables you to keep your gains. You're never going to really have to worry about loss aversion. That's okay. However, if you are facing a possibly catastrophic future, or at least a future that's slowly wearing you down instead of uplifting you, um, then really, you know, you might want to seek out variance. And you want to seek out variance 
in things people have not considered to seek out variance in before. Uh, there are ways to be, say, contrarian that are super stereotyped, right? There are ways to be, um, you know, the, the midlife crisis is an interesting example of a stereotyped thing you are supposed to engage in to, you know, you know, enliven yourself. And it never works, right? Of course it doesn't work. It's just another script. Um, so I feel the the seeking of that aliveness, I think it's it's almost when you feel there is a concrete, you know, there is a there's a nearly irresistible calling to aliveness you can find within yourself. And it does, it does feel alive, right? That's why I coined this phrase, right? I didn't use, you know, uh, PC versus NPC that, you know, you see on in internet memes, because I think it does not actually evoke the subjective feeling of it. Right. And the subjective, the subjective feeling is um, it's sort of like, you know, you get more out of a minute than you might otherwise get out of a day. So you talked about the subjective feeling, are there practices or what are the, how, I guess the $6 million question, how do you become a live player? I mean, I don't think I, I don't think I can claim to know. All I did here was really, you know, systematically observe the kind of per people that generate successful responses to their environment and to some extent, limited personal experience, right? I wouldn't make a claim that I'm reliably a life player, but I believe I've certainly had moments of it, right? That where it's, it is like almost a transcendent feeling and a very desirable, desirable one in a way, at least philosophically. Um, the answer is hard to give because I think that actually human beings have vastly different minds. I think our biologies are very similar. But the perspective we take within our biology, right, within this, you know, calling it a computer is incorrect, I think, this, this organ that is the brain, this, this body integrated system that we are, that we do not fully understand. Um, I think, you know, one can easily have been through the course of one's life, five, six, or seven very fundamentally different kinds of minds. And we all perhaps perform and share norms so that we get along, so that we seem stable. But, you know, internal spiritual and emotional transformations, they're actually significant. I think if we had a real understanding of psychology, of something like physics, we would see something as complex and nuanced as, say, you know, stellar evolution, where you go from, you know, a mainline star to an expanding red dwarf, collapses eventually into a black hole or something like this, right? Minds actually would be a most fascinating thing to study, but I think I don't think we really have a science of perspective taking. Uh, we could again argue about spiritual traditions, but I actually feel that spiritual traditions are often difficult to mine for insight, for the same reason that the term again authenticity in 1980s California is completely different than in 2020s California. The typical person who uses the same words does not mean the same thing over time. That changes due to a host of sociological, cultural, individual factors. You have to keep reinventing the words. Now, again, here, like there's a very, you know, there's a useful piece of cultural heritage to describe this. You know, the, you know, the the Tao that can be spoken is not, you know, it's not the Tao. It's sort of the finger. It's not the moon. You have all these useful ways of saying this. Um, but, you know, of course, saying them doesn't necessarily bring you any closer. Um, I do think that there are some practical pieces of advice I can give, which is uh, consider the possibility that you are much more deeply entwined with the people around you than might be at first apparent, and that you are perhaps not bringing out the best in those people. So I'm not actually advocating for a radical individualism when I propose being a live player. I am advocating drawing upon different uh, different affordances that other people offer. Now, in the extreme, that might require changing people, but I feel, I feel so much of deadness is downstream of a desire for physical safety and a desire for social safety. So I, I guess bravery, I think bravery 
you know, courage, most fundamentally social courage and physical courage, easier to describe, easier to, you know, praise than feel might just be the thing that suddenly deconstrains you in a whole number of ways that has these at first subtle and then ever greater, greater effects on you. Awesome. This has been a fascinating conversation. I could um, find more questions myself, but I think we should switch to the Q&A because there's been some great contributions. And so, Ethan, um, would you like to unmute yourself? Because I think this follows on quite well from what Samo was just asked, just saying about that we don't necessarily have any maps for this. Yeah, uh, first of all, Thanks for being here, Samo. Really enjoying this and appreciate your work generally. Um, yeah, my question is, is just around whether or not you see a mapping from this concept of live players to any of the adult psychological developmental models, like Keegan stage-based model, some of the stuff in spiral dynamics, um, and any other models like that you might be aware of. Um, yep, I think that there is a very natural mapping to a whole number of concepts from different psychological traditions. Um, you know, say we could discuss concepts such as embodying, you know, self actualization, um, you know, shadow integration if you're going Jungian or whatever. Um, but I think the basic problem with each of these, well, first, the first problem is. I'm not a deep expert in each of these schools, and I tend to believe that when it comes to psychology, the popular version is, you know, the popular version is much less potent than the original texts or the original practices themselves. If you look at the history of the development of psychological schools, and I actually did, I visited, um, you know, I went and visited Vienna, I, I took the opportunity to like dive into some of uh, Freud's material that you can still even find there and like, you know, accounts of his life and like the, the music, talk to the museum staff and so on as well. Um, like, you know, the, these founders of psychology schools, they, they basically often created cults, which in a way is like positive and negative, right? The negative association of cults are obvious. I won't discuss them too much. It can be exploitative. They can be predatory. They can be destabilizing, but the positive aspect of it is, you know, if someone really did figure out something about human psychology, you would expect that person to be not just like, you know, a benign friend you talk to, to solve your problems. Uh, they would be something of a scary wizard. They would be someone that could actually, you know, kind of pull you in, turn you inside out, and then send you out into the world, right? They, they might not be a benevolent wizard at all. They would have this significant amount of power over people, right? Almost like a little bit of a, of a, of a Rasputin vibe. And for that reason, I feel that psychological study in human societies has just not been done very much. It's in a way too dangerous. It's too culturally destabilizing, right? There are even today social theorists who would argue that we have not, as a civilization, uh, processed Freudian insights and have not really found a way to fit them into our culture, that we had to water them down, that we had to falsify them, that we had to buy bypass them and so on. The same could be applied of deeper, like say, deeper traditions, spiritual traditions, religious traditions, right? Um, I think almost all Christian authors, uh, you know, agreed that Jesus's true message was unwelcome. Uh, similarly, you know, Confucius had some interesting points on the marginalization of the scholar that understands the inner meaning of ritual, not just the proprieties of ritual. Uh, Buddhism and so on is very pessimistic about the ability to bring in true knowledge into the world and so on. So, you know, first off, again, I have some ignorance. Secondly, I have some skepticism as to how can we find, you know, the actual high integrity body of knowledge. Um, but having said all of this, all of these caveats, I'll say that, uh, yes, actually, I think I think many of these schools are directly trying to study this question under different names. Like they're directly trying to, and they're often succeeding, but how often that particular tradition of knowledge lasts? Well, I think that depends on, you know, surrounding social conditions, right? It might last hundreds of years. It might be gone, you know, even before the founder is dead. Like the founder might be, might actually decide to just drop it or just be quiet. Right. 
We might come to one of your your other questions in a minute, Ethan, because um, that also got quite a lot of upvotes. But uh, Bruce, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, basically, the people that we've heard of in the world, are there some people out there who are very much live players that you could point to? There could even be characters in movies that are easy to talk about. And uh, do they end up being listened to? And if, if they do not, then why not? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, I have to emphasize being a live player does not automatically mean that you're a, a quote unquote good guy, that you're someone that everyone likes or that everyone agrees with. And I also already alluded to the fact that a society with too many live players might be in for revolution, strife, war, right? So having said that, um, you know, I'm going to start with the most controversial ones. It seems to me Vladimir Putin is pretty Putin is pretty much a live player, right? Think about the many career jumps uh, through the course of his life. Uh, think about the unusual moves in foreign policy Russia has undertaken. Russia really is a relatively poor country, a country with a shrinking demographic base. Yet for some reason, everyone mentions it in the same breath as China. Like it's really punching above its weight radically, right? Um, a different historical example might be, say, uh, Napoleon. Right. Napoleon was considered to be, you know, just a very negative figure by most Europeans at the time, unless they happened to be French. Uh, but no one really denied a deep, relevant genius, a genius that extended beyond war. Right. Um, the systematization of law under Napoleon, the Code Napoleon, is still the basis of law in most of continental Europe. Right. The armies. Uh, didn't just spread, you know, sort of French revolutionary ideals. They enforced different sets of codes of law, which once changed, often were not reverted to the previous more feudal arrangements. Uh, he even has a mathematical theorem named after him, and you know, annoyed Laplace uh, by you know demonstrating a proof that Laplace hadn't known previously. Laplace found it immensely frustrating because you know, great mathematician himself. Uh, you know, this idea that Napoleon, who's already so overhyped, could do this too, was almost viscerally upsetting. <laughs> it's sort of like the, the frustration of I dedicated my life to this and you just waltz in from the battlefield and you can do some things that I can't. Well, OK, that's that's no fun. <laughs> um, still. Um, what about the, current, the current arena, people who are alive in the world today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I had already, I already, I'd already mentioned sort of Putin as Putin. one possible, yeah, yeah, as one example. I, I start off with Putin, but then I gave Napoleon as another example. Um, I think Elon Musk, uh, for now at least, seems to be a live player. Though I sometimes worry that he will find the experience of being in the simulation of being a celebrity much more rewarding than actually undertaking new new ventures. Um, I think Jeff Bezos remains a live player as well, where note that his retirement isn't a retirement into idleness, but is a rededication to his space program, which until now has been sort of low key, right? I'm talking about Blue Origin here. Uh, I actually suspect that well, part of the motivation for stepping down as CEO of Amazon, it was less being pessimistic about Amazon continuing to grow, continuing to be a successful company, uh, and more a desire to catch up with Elon. I think their personal rivalry, you know, people can denounce it. It's like, you know, the exploration of space shouldn't come from the rivalry of two people. You know, the economic development of space should be done for the benefit of all mankind and so on. But, you know, the last time we had something done for the benefit of all mankind in space, you know, when astronauts landed on the moon, this was also done in competition between, you know, not two individuals, but two superpowers, right? Would have never been prioritized otherwise. So there's a strange dynamic that happens with live players in competition where they are competitive, but not necessarily that imitative, right? So they're not going to try to do what everyone else does, but they might try to do things that other exceptional individuals are doing. And, you know, um, a different example might be someone who, you know, I suspect actually struggles quite a bit. Uh, you know, I think. I think that, um, you know, I think that Kanye West is something of a life player. He's reinvented his artistic style numerous times, produced a failed presidential run, but, you know, he attempted it, right? Now, these are, you know, 
sort of super famous examples, right? These are these are people that sort of have a brand that goes with it. Are there people who are less high profile but still very interesting? Um, you know, I would say that um, you know the Turkish Turkey's president Erdogan is an interesting example. I don't agree with him politically. However, I note that in just seven years, Turkey has developed a domestic manufacturing base, building enough drones to be able to tip the balance in the Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Before this, you know, no one was expecting Turkey to develop such a high-end military product, especially one that requires not just advanced manufacturing capability, but excellent software expertise and machine learning expertise, right? How did that happen? Um, how did he manage to get the European Union to pay him such vast amounts of money for intercepting refugee flows? Uh, why was he capable of completely toppling uh, the government, you know, the almost government of Libya that the French government with much more resources supported? And I could keep on listing these like small anomalous things that he has going for him. Um, you know, economically, you know, uh, I feel that there are companies that are definitely still led by live players that are a little bit less well known because they're not American companies. You know, I think Reliance is an interesting example. Um, it's one that people do mention, but I don't think people realize just how ambitious that type of company can be. Now, I could I could talk about this for quite a bit more. You asked an excellent question, but uh, in, for, for the sake of time, I think I'll wrap it up there for, for this you. particular question. Awesome. Thank you. So in a second, uh, Julia, I'm going to ask you which question of yours you'd like to, to ask. But there's been a bit of chat in the about uh, Hitler, Second World War, which I'm oh my God. Fascinated, well, as to whether Hitler was a live player or not, um, which I find fascinating that, that there's a few different views in the, in the chat. But my, I, I'm fascinated by the Second World War, like this incredible clash of, of ideologies and, and ideas and um, my my understanding or my model of it, at least, is that the, the Nazis probably were a live player and that they were doing things differently. The whole idea of Blitzkrieg was a new invention, but they then but so they came up with a lot of, of new ideas, but then stopped effectively. And I see the evolution of the Second World War from 1941 to 1942 as the British effectively outflanking them by being more of a live player. The example of the Enigma machine being per, the perfect example because the enigma machine was incredibly complicated but once the british had cracked it they cracked it and the germans were not in the well, did not then sort of develop anything new but they found they produced incredibly complex ways of of behaving but then eventually the british outthought and out evolved them in a more live player fashion that would be my version of it but i'd love to hear your thoughts i think i would broadly agree with that I think the technological contribution of World War II Britain is greatly underrated, partially because it's sort of laundered as American contribution. Say, when we think of radar today, we actually do not primarily associate this with World War II Britain. When we think of the atomic bomb project, you know, we might hear of Einstein's letter getting sort of, you know, misplaced in the mail, eventually noticed, and so on. But what we don't hear is that the British government started nuclear weapons research before the American government. It was actually a memo from the British government requesting assistance and cooperation on it that sparked serious American investment in nuclear weapons research. In fact, the British continued to contribute to the nuclear weapons program throughout World War II, which is why many in a the British state felt betrayed after World War II when America did the, you know, realpolitik very reasonable uh, you know, very, very reasonable thing of uh, denying their best friends nuclear weapons. You know, so after World War II, the British who had contributed to the American nuclear weapon uh, had to just undertake their own effort to acquire such weapons. So yeah, I would definitely agree with this technologically. Britain and Germany both produced basically most of the technology of the second half of the 20th century in those few years, or at least laid the foundations for them. Jet engines, rocketry, sonar, radar, computers. Computers were built during World War II, right? Uh, and it's certainly the case that the Enigma machine and you know, information technology, encryption, decryption, proved to be a decisive advantage in the Second World War. Um, so yeah, it's, 
it's also the case that all so many of these leaders, you know, they, they were live players. In a way, sometimes I wonder, why does everyone from World War II seem, you know, every leader, you know, Charles de Gaulle, Winston Churchill, Mussolini, you know, Stalin, you know, they all seem larger than life. And sometimes, you know, it feels to me, maybe, maybe they weren't larger than life. Maybe we today are smaller than life. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Julia. Hi. Yeah, I want to update my question a little bit um, and ask, uh, um, we started off by talking about uh, the pandemic and whether, you know, it was a window for social change and it looks like it isn't. And then we talked about the concept of live players and to my mind, it was tied to that kind of social systems change. And now when we talk about people like Erdogan, Putin, uh, you know, and Bezos, for example, they are the reinforcers of the current institutions. So they're live players, but they're exploiters of the existing systems. So I wanted to ask whether there's a, you know, value system paradigm to this um, uh, concept of live leader and, uh, uh, you know, whether, yeah, there's some sort of a social justice element to it or interconnectedness or something like that. And my other related question, if there is, then, you know, my kind of theory I personally believe in and want to test is whether UBI is something that would turn more people into live players. But yeah, the, the kind of the, the more key question is social progress and um, social change and live leaders. Right, right. Um... Yep, I certainly think that social change in the 20th century came through live players, right? It's very hard to deny that something like the use of nonviolence with regard to particularly trying to get the British to, you know, let your people go was brilliant. It worked theologically, it worked politically, it worked economically. It was the right tool for the right job. So, you know, Gandhi is like a little bit less revered right now than he might have been 60 or 70 years ago. But I think he was definitely a life player and, and brilliant politically, but also like, you know, had these these other admirable qualities, right? The moral valence was perhaps positive. Um, you know, in the United States, civil rights certainly had life players, right? It's hard to read uh, about Malcolm X or MLK and not come to conclusions that there is like Again, this, this live player dynamic, the intentional driving of social change. In fact, I wish today, honestly, you know, I was half expecting to see an individual emerge this summer uh, during BLM protests and, the, and also the riots. Uh, but I really, I, I haven't seen anyone yet, right? And I do, I do expect that there is particular individuality, right? That happens here. It's, it's an individual experience. And I do think we would we would hear of such a person. Still, um, having said all of that, I think that social reform is it's not even that it's it's desirable. I think it's just necessary. I think we are currently in an unsustainable unsustainable trajectory. Unsustainable in the sense that we are, are going to have to start eating more and more into our reserves or imposing more and more difficult exploitative practices on the existing system and exploitative say of things, not just natural resources or human time or emotions, but like more abstract, uh, but very real resources, such as say, you know, our epistemic commons, um, you know, the possibility of uh, social, uh, the possibility of, of technological progress, scientific research, uh, the possibilities of, you know, maintaining an adaptive uh, response to the ecosystem, say, if we were the kind of society that would say that would not produce problems such as global warming, we in fact could handle global warming just fine, because we would be already adaptive, responsive to the ecosystem and be in an integrated system with the ecosystem. So the fact that we would inherit a problem as severe as global warming wouldn't be an issue because we would adapt to it, we would change 
Uh, we would, in fact, change our social and political structures. We would change our inputs and our outputs, and we would get into a dynamic dance and stabilize in a maybe warmer plan planet, but a quite livable planet. Our problem with global warming is that we are stuck doing exactly what we're doing. Now, again, I don't think it's I don't think global warming is necessarily, again, the apocalypse. I feel it's going to be a little bit like COVID-19, but drawn over 20 or 30 years. And again, used by the system, perhaps will acknowledge it as a problem, but will mostly this use this acknowledgement of something as a problem as the fuel uh, for even further undesirable, say, you know, doubling downs on the way we already do things. Um, to briefly comment on UBI, I feel that the unsolved problem of UBI is once UBI is introduced, I do believe that there are many people who will, in fact, you know, acqu acquire higher levels of self-actualization. However, it's not exactly clear to me what method of political organization people on UBI have to maintain UBI and to maintain their relevant participation in the economic and political system of society. Let me explain what I mean. The reason we are obsessed about jobs is because being employed at a large company is fundamentally our most important political relationship. It's not even an economic relationship, it's a political relationship, right? When a large company employs 50,000 or 100,000 people in a state, you know, the governor is not thinking economically whether to keep these jobs or not keep these jobs or pass regulations or not pass regulations. Uh, they're thinking in this almost corporatist way where they're negotiating with a strong political entity. So as an employee, one is a political resource. I feel as someone who receives UBI, well, if it's not UBI, if it's, you know, uh, essentially, you know, a, a welfare system, then you're still kind of a political asset, right? You are a voter bank. Your job is to press the button that gives you uh, that gives you these benefits. But as soon as it's UBI, you suddenly are no longer a political asset. You're a political liability. You're this you know random character that doesn't need a job that cannot be fired for their job for saying the wrong things on the internet. So what are you going to do? You give everyone UBI and then you censor everything they say on the internet, or let's say it's not censoring on the internet. Let's say it's showing up for protests. Are you going to start arresting people that show up at protests? It's, it's this kind of thing where on the surface, it's a very small change. I certainly think it's almost economically sustainable. Um, I think COVID showed us, right, you know, about half of the population turned out to be non-essential workers, right? Essential worker is just another term for actual worker. And so many of us, you know, like myself, who are, you know, spending most of our times on Zoom calls should really ask ourselves whether we are in bullshit jobs and whether we're, you know, an economically exploitive class and are complicit in it, right? Because the actual workers are the essential workers, quote unquote, they're the people who are risking COVID, um, what does it mean that we were able to bubble ourselves in this way? I feel it's almost obscene. Um, but, uh, but I think this political problem of UBI is unsolved. I tend to be, you know, kind of like, let's say idealistic, somewhat pragmatic in the sense that I believe you kind of have to find the solutions that are, are politically compatible. I think no self-interested government or regime is is going to implement UBI unless they have an answer of. So once UBI is implemented, why do these people not overthrow us? Why are they not the biggest problem we've ever had instantly? So you need to find this this sort of, you know, square that circle. How to have something that's win-win for both elites and the general population, because otherwise uh, elites will always side in their own favor. Really interesting um, thoughts about UBI. Um, before we I think we'll we'll end with Ethan's question about game B, but before we do that, uh, Sonia has um, asked if I can ask this for her because she put this very pointedly, and I think it, it it's a really interesting way of framing it. So far, most of the names that have come up uh, sound like narcissists. Are there any live players who actually care about <laughs> life on the planet? Is Greta Thunberg one? I, I think we'll see. I think we'll see. I mean, Greta did a remarkable, you know, has lived a remarkable last few years. 
uh, we'll see what she does in the future. But then, you know, maybe I should ask you the question, why are you so sure Greta is not a narcissist? Right? I think we should be very skeptical of anyone that spends a lot of time in front of cameras and a lot of time listening to their own voice and reading their own writing. I think writers, musicians, politicians, these are narcissistic people. You know, Albert Einstein was insufferable. He was the original arrogant physicist, right? Galileo was, you know, a really annoying guy. He didn't get in trouble uh, just for proposing heliocentrism. He got in trouble for like incessantly critiquing everyone except himself. Now, having said this, I think truly pathological narcissists have a hard time succeeding. And the reason is they will reliably fail long-term theory of mind and will fail to acquire teams and allies. Now, I really don't want to like, you know, get political and, and, you know, I don't really comment on past and live politicians, but I will say that, you know, it's, it's a big red flag when a charismatic politician does not have long-term collaborators. That is a loyal team of people around them that believe in them. So apply that heuristic as you will, but long-term allies and collaborators are irreplaceable. Right. And whatever one might think of, say, someone like Bezos, the fact is most of his employees have worked with him for a very, very long time. And most of his allies have been his allies for a very, very long time. So he is at least capable of treating them well. Right. And, you know, the same is, again, true of, you know, say, Putin. I think he's more like mildly sociopathic than, say, narcissistic in the classical sense. Uh, the bodyguard, you know, there's this bodyguard he befriended when they were both working for the mayor of St. Petersburg, that he then made his own bodyguard once he was running for office, and then made uh, the same bodyguard, the chief of his staff, you know, for, for sorry, his, uh, his security detail, and recently appointed him as the main commander of the National Guard. One way to look at this is that this is, you know, uh, this is, you know, nepotism, this isn't meritocratic, this is political cronyism. But really, this also means that this, you know, Putin was capable of maintaining this man's loyalty, this man that could easily like help get Putin killed by just not doing his job quite as well, right? The Praetorian Guard historically is a great example. The Praetorian Guard was charged with protecting Roman emperors, but eventually they just went as so far as to uh, auction off the imperial throne and, you know, kill an emperor that they didn't like or allow an emperor that they didn't like to be killed. So, you know, that Putin can maintain that loyalty interpersonally, you know, even if it's, you know, materially corrupt or whatever, uh, that suggests he's not a classical narcissist. Classical narcissists are quite self-destructive people. Awesome. So, Ethan, your question relates to game B. With regard to moving towards a civilization that sort of integrates with the complex natural environment, you know, game B is one of the the kind of movements right now that's trying to do something like that. I'd love to hear your overall perspective on it. Like how hopeful are you that it could lead to meaningful change? And if it does or doesn't, what are the crucial factors um, that will determine that? And then maybe attack on what are you most hopeful about, whether game B, blockchain technology, or something else right now in terms of things that will actually move us in a positive direction? I think that I am very optimistic about midterm philosophical reevaluations of both our current political as well as economic and social commitments. I actually think the space is wide open for new perspectives on society in a way that it simply wasn't 30 years ago, 10 years ago, or 50 years ago. The reason is partially a breaking of old media chokeholds, but even more important than this. Uh, I think that it is, you know, so many things were disproven by events. If you say query your intuitions as to how respected are the opinions of economists right before the 2008 financial crisis versus after, how respected are economists right before the economic troubles of COVID-19 and right after, how respected are public health officials in their pronouncements. Now, of course, this is a little bit pessimistic, right? I'm already suggesting that there was a massive overshoot in how much credence and trust we put 
in experts versus the actual epistemic achievements of the experts? And we are undergoing a useful corrective. But I'm optimistic not because, you know, there's a just comeuppance, but because intellectual hegemony, hegemony in the technical sense, has been broken. Therefore, for the first time in a long time, uh, you know, the space for social thought is allowed. The first step about producing novel, you know, insights, new ways of seeing things, new ways of doing things is being this, you know, remarkably arrogant and, you know, deciding that, you know, you might be able to do better. You might be able to know better. Um, you know, why be a scientist if there are 600,000 scientists in the world and you know that, you know, you're not really looking forward to the drudgery of, you know, post-graduate work. It's much easier to decide to become a contemporary, you know, gentleman or gentlewoman scientist if you say believe that yes, actually the six hundred thousand scientists are trapped in a dysfunctional careerist system, which causes them to undersell or even bury their most interesting results in favor of stupid games like publish or perish. Um, it's it's the 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 credibility to individuals to to attempt novel intellectual work has just never been better. And how does your concept of, just to make it explicit, how does your concept of live players relate to the game B conversation? I think basically that um, our society needs to radically shift to an equilibria that is more friendly to live players. I did describe that too many live players can be socially problematic in various ways, but the sort of like, you know, you know, the game B concept, I think is just very good in the sense that it is, well, firstly, it's well-named, right? It's like very clear that the game we have been playing until now is not working. And it's in fact hitting diminishing returns at every level. Uh, secondly, I think the focus on psychology and interpersonal dynamics is in a way very positive. You know, it's sometimes left implicit rather than explicit, but I've seen plenty of explicit material too. Uh, and the reason for that is I think it's micro social dynamics that are actually breaking down in a number of ways. Like say the New York Times, sure, you could argue that it has issues because global trends have changed, but really often what's broken down is what happens in the editorial room or what happens between the relationship between say uh, the employee employees within that company. Um, and, you know, say the classroom, maybe literally the classroom at elite universities has broken down where it once used to be a safe space for ideas. Now it certainly is not a safe space for, for ideas, even if it's a more sensitive to, to other valid concerns um, or, you know, sometimes like spurious ones, but we've lost a whole number of social, we, we've lost a whole lot of social technologies. Say, for example, I'm not sure we still have juries. I'm sure we see juries on TV. But the functional role of juries in the legal system might have been completely bypassed by now. Now, that's a big conversation. We could talk about it. But like an actual jury system is a remarkable piece of social technology uh, designed to counteract numerous human biases and also, yes, be compatible with political constraints while still enabling you know, meaningful participation in the business of sub self-government uh, for citizenry. Um, and I, I just don't think we really have it right now. There are all sorts of things that exist in name only, that remain in name only. And, uh, you know, I think, I think Game B acknowledges that and also acknowledges that we need in social invention, social innovation. Uh, merely changing the material technologies around us will not save us because we already have such a material surplus that we could easily solve a whole number of socially intractable problems. Yet no matter how many material resources we deploy to them, they seem to never get better. And our material resources are mysteriously wearing thin as well. Samo, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, if people want to follow up on your work, where would you direct them to? Uh, yep, you can find um, a collection of all my writing on my website, uh, samoburia.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or find some of my videos on uh, YouTube. Awesome. Yeah, this has been well overdue, and I'm really glad that you made the time for this because this has been fascinating. So um, as we traditionally do at the end of these uh, calls, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and we'll say thank you and goodbye to, to Samo. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This is to let you know about a brand new course that we're running together with Peter Lindbergh of the Stoa. It's called Becoming a Live Player and brings together a lot of what we've been covering on Rebel Wisdom over the last few years with a combination of ideas and practices. The concept of live player comes from Samo Berger and it means a person who's capable of new behavior in a world where many people and organizations are running off scripts or dead players. Our current moment, no one knows what really what the fuck is going on or what the fuck to do. <laughs> and this is sort of like the, the challenge landscape, the, the, the three aspects of it, the meaning crisis, the culture war, uh, the meta crisis. The meaning crisis is sort of like not having a philosophy, an individual philosophy or collective philosophy of life that kind of can support like an ecology of practices that imbues a sense of meaningfulness in our life. Um, and, and in fact, the culture at large uh, it does the opposite. It supports kind of like a sense of meaninglessness. So we built it around the concept of serious play, which is something that Professor John Vaveki, who will be one of the guest teachers, talks about a lot. I talk about the importance of serious play um, and that our culture, our culture doesn't know how to deal with play. We either trivialize it into entertainment and fun, or we say, no, then it must be work. And we've split the course into three sections based on the model that Daniel Schmachtenberger was talking about recently. And the only answer out of the oppression or chaos is the comprehensive education of everyone in the capacity to understand at least three things. They have to increase their first person, second person, and third person epistemics. Their third person epistemics is the easiest. Philosophy of science, formal logic, their ability to actually make sense of base reality through appropriate methodology and find appropriate confidence margin. Second person is my ability to make sense of your perspective. Can I steel man where you're coming from? Can I inhabit your position well? And if I'm not oriented to do that, then I'm not gonna find the synthesis of a dialectic. I'm gonna be arguing for one side of partiality harming something that will actually harm the thing I care about in the long run. And then first person, can I notice my own biases and my own susceptibilities and my own group identity issues and whatever well enough that those aren't the things that run me? So we've turned this three-part epistemics into the three different types of play that we need to develop with 10 guest teachers. First person play, looking at our biases, shadow work and embodiment. Second person play, how we relate to each other with empathy circles, authentic relating, and third person play, which is objective, reasoning and argumentation with practices like street epistemology and mental models. So Peter and I have been talking about this and planning it for the last few months. And by definition, this will be a live exploration into the unknown that we'll all go on together. You're designing not only a story that you're telling, but it's a story that you're experiencing. There's something really beautiful about mm -hmm. that. And I guess our task is to combine this kind of exploration of the cultural landscape, the culture war landscape, the meaning crisis, the meta crisis, and provide the practices with a whole load of guest facilitators that explore different aspects of that and different skills to become a live player. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's important um just to be clear that uh, neither you or i are epistemic authorities on like uh the meaning crisis or, or, or the culture war 2.0 or uh the meta crisis um but we are um i would say experts at designing experiences um like i've taken your uh, uh men's retreat in uh, in london like chef's kiss was a beautiful uh, experience and you know i've been uh, that's my, my background that's my career is is, is designing uh, training and experiences for people and like what you said you and i have two skill sets that complement each other nicely you have that that journalistic kind of narrative story arc and i have this like weird meta perspective that i can kind of see the landscape of all these players and so that's what we're bringing here uh, uh in this really unique experience of this this course you can find out a bit more information on the website the link is below and we hope to see you soon.